If you are new to our channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Let's go to the Eye of the Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. Marissa McClellan is a full-time food writer and canning teacher and is a voice behind Food in Jars. She is the author of three canning-related books and soon to be another book one and two of her recipes actually won me awards in the wisconsin state fair canning competition welcome to the program marissa hi there thanks for having me i'm really glad to be here well thank you for taking time and uh, for uh, and to share some of your canning knowledge with holly myself and, and all of our listeners so you do a lot of small batch canning there seems to be misconception you have to can in large amounts um tell us more about the small batch canning absolutely so um i i guess you know maybe seven or eight years ago um I started scaling down recipes. You know, when I first started canning and when I was a kid, we always made big batches. And then when I was doing it in my own kitchen, it's just my husband and me, and I would make, you know, six pints of jam and then, you know, nine pints of pickles. And I looked around and thought, we can't eat all this, you know, if I want to keep canning. And so I decided to uh, work to cut down recipes and create things that were maybe two or three pints or half pints so that I could continue making things because I loved the process of doing it, but do it in a way where I wasn't producing more more than we could possibly use. And so um, I often use just, you know, like a quart of produce or a couple pounds as my limiting factor and then create recipes that just use that so that if you shop at the farmer's market or you have a small garden that's not pumping out tons and tons of produce, you can make little batches and still feel really satisfied. Now, with these small batches, is this more uh, keen towards water bath canning, or can we also do the small batches in the pressure can form? Um, I'm mostly focused on either water bath canning or dehydrating or fermenting or freezing when I'm doing the small batches. You certainly could fire up the pressure canner for a small batch, but that always feels like a little bit more work. Um, Typically, if I'm going to pull out the pressure canner, and uh, what I might do is do a couple of small batches all at the same time that have similar processing times. Like, that's how I would scale for um, small batches in the pressure canner. But what I like about the small batches in the water bath canner is that you can then use a smaller canner so you don't have to heat up as much water to process everything, and it makes the whole experience go much faster. Right, and there are smaller canners. We've got one, I think it's a five pint or something of that yeah, nature instead of a seven quarter or nine yeah, quarter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes I even use, like, a little asparagus pot to serve as a small batch canner, you know, because they come with a little rack and they hold, you can just do a single pint jar in an asparagus steamer and it, you know, works really well, especially if you're at that point in the summer where the refrigerator is full. And even if you made a tiny bet, tiny batch and you could just put it in the fridge, the fridge is so full with all the stuff coming out of the garden that you just need it to be shelf stable. And, and I want to bring up here, and I want you to confirm this, that people will get the Instapot, and that is not a safe way of canning on any level. That is correct. You cannot can in the Instant Pot. Um, they have said that they're bringing to market a version that you could can in, but they haven't shared any of their data or research as to how they have determined that it is safe for canning. So at this point, um, the National Center for Home Food Preservation and the Ball Company and all the other canning bodies, they have determined that it is not safe to can in any electric multi-cooker or pressure cooker. Well, when people go to, <clears throat> go to your website and read your books, many people may think that you live, uh, you have a large garden and, or some kind of a small hobby farm as you preserve all of this food, but you are not really in those locations. Let everybody know where you actually live and, and how you actually do all this canning. Well, so I live in downtown Philadelphia. I live on the 20th floor of a high-rise, so I have, you know, I'm in an apartment. I don't have any outdoor space. Um, I don't even have a community garden plot, um, and I have an 80-square-foot kitchen. So my space is pretty limited, but I look at my limitations just as, you know, something that helps me be creative rather than feeling stuck by them. And, you know, I figure I'm a really good example that if I can do it in my space, anybody can do it. Right, and I'm sure your husband, is. was it a, a team effort that he said, okay, you're going to do this and you're going to save us money and we're going to eat healthier, or was it more of a you had to sell the ideal to him? I had to sell it to him. He, was, he wasn't real interested, um, and to be honest, he is not a huge fan of jam or pickles, which is sort of sad, um, but he does love the corn salsa that I make every summer, and... Um, And he really loves my canning habit when it comes time um, to make gift baskets for his coworkers around the holidays. That's when he's like, ah, yes, I see the utility in this. 
Definitely, definitely, they do make great gifts. Yes, now, I'm, I'm always curious uh, myself as a, a city girl who learned canning within the last um, half of a decade. How did you get into canning? Well, so I grew up in Portland, Oregon, um, and not in the country. I grew up in you know in Portland proper, but Portland is one of those places where blackberries grow wild every summer all over the city and there are apple trees and there's just this abundance of fruit around and so we would make jam every summer and make applesauce in the fall and so I learned to do it from my mom and my mom had learned to do it um, actually in her hippie days <laughs> she was uh, you know like a, in 1970 in San Francisco hippie and um, there was a lot of back to the land stuff at that period of time and so she had learned to do it then and then um, during my childhood called on that knowledge to just make little batches of things and so then when I was in my 20s and in grad school I was living here in Philadelphia by that point and uh, one day I went blueberry picking and I brought home 13 pounds of blueberries because when you pick blueberries, it's just kind of, it's an easy thing to pick and you don't realize how much you're picking until you get home and you think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with 13 pounds of blueberries? And the, the first thing that occurred to me was to make a batch of jam like we'd done when I was a kid. And there was just something about the process of making jam that I loved. I loved the experience of making something and knowing it was going to last. You know, when you make a meal, you have a sort of limited um, period of enjoyment and pleasure from that meal, whereas when you can something, you get to really relive the the joy of picking that fruit and then making the jam, and you get to experience that, you know, for months. Well, and so that was the, my trigger. That was the thing that got me. Uh, when we do uh, canning demonstrator talks, Holly's got one coming up this week, we get a lot of questions. What is one of the most common questions that you receive when you uh, do your teaching classes on canning? Well, the very most common thing is people want to know, is this safe? Am I going to do any harm to anybody um, by canning? And, you know, I always feel really lucky to be able to put their heart at rest and say, you know, with these high acid preserves like jams and pickles, there's no danger of creating anything um, that could be harmful. You know, if something goes wrong, it's going to be mold or it's going to ferment, and you'll know. So it's really hard to do, create something that's dangerous with water bath canning. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. Um, I know a lot of times people get canning burnout, You, especially um, a lot, you know, people who do can larger amounts. By the time October comes, you're like, I don't want to stare at this canner anymore. Do you have any tips on how to avoid canning burnout uh, for us who do, do a lot of canning? Well, um, I would say that it's good to, you know, earlier in the season create a list of things that you really love so that you know what you're looking forward to preparing, so that, you know, if you are feeling burnt out in August, but your very favorite thing is pear vanilla jam, and you think by, you know, September I'm just done, and then you're going to have to live without that pear vanilla jam for months and months, you know, you want to really think about what you love having in your pantry, and often that can help pull you through that burnout. Um, I also think that the small batches are a really good um, way to combat that because if you're not spending hours and hours in the kitchen, um, you can really feel a little bit better about it. And then finally, there's always your freezer. You know, if you're feeling burnt out and you really desperately want to have a particular preserve, you know, put it in the free, put that, you know, like the tomatoes or the blackberries or whatever you want to make, put it in the freezer and give yourself a little time to recover before you tackle that next project. Well, and that small batch thing works really, really well if you're creating a batch of something that you've never had before. Like we did cowboy yeah. candy one time, and I think we had to do eight co eight pints or something. We found out we didn't like it very much because it was too hot. If we would have just done one or two pints, we would have saved a lot of time and not had to find somebody that would want to eat that. Absolutely. Well, you've got two books out. You've got another one coming out. How can people find your books and find more about you and, and uh, questions that they might have in regards to small batch canning? Absolutely. So um, my website is foodinjars.com. So food in, you put the food in the jars. And um, the three books I have out now are available wherever books are sold. If you search for my name, Marisa McClellan, you'll find them. Um, and then the fourth book will be out in April. And I am also on Instagram and Facebook at Food and Jars, so you can find me just about anywhere. And I do lots of live canning demos on Facebook Live throughout the summer. So if people have questions, they can watch live and ask me while I'm canning in my own kitchen, and I'll get back to them. And you're also uh, uh, Instagram as well yep. and, and that type of thing. Well, uh, and, and with... Uh 
one one last question here. Yeah. With the canning lids, there's two different types of canning lids. There's um, the the old two piece, and then what is the other one, Holly? That that people will the reusable lids. Yeah. Yes. Reusable lids. Is there one that you recommend other more than the other? I typically use the um, disposable two two piece lids because I find that the um, the reusable lids have a higher rate of failure. Um, particularly if you are an inexperienced canner. And then the other reason is that they're expensive. And um, if you want to share your pro- you know, the things you've made with friends and family, you don't want to worry about getting that expensive lid back. Um, so I find that I prefer the, uh, the disposable ones. And the, the reusable ones in large part came up because the disposable ones used to have BPA in the lining, but um, Ball has since removed that. So that concern doesn't exist with the disposable ones anymore. Well, Marissa, we greatly appreciate your time and sharing your canning knowledge with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for checking out the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. For more, go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for full length in studio video and podcast replay of season one. Season two underway and added weekly. Tweet us at TWVG Show or hashtag TWVG to be part of the program.